Book 4. I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things, then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. I do not want to wage war against what is ugly. I do not want to accuse, I do not even want to accuse those who accuse. Looking away shall be my only negation. And all in all, and on the whole, someday I wish to be only a yes-sayer. There is a certain high point in life, once we have reached that, we are, for all our freedom. Once more in the greatest danger of spiritual unfreedom. And no matter how much we have faced up to the beautiful chaos of existence and denied it all providential reason and goodness, we still have to pass our hardest test. For it is only now that the idea of a personal providence confronts us with the most penetrating force. And the best advocate. The evidence of our eyes, speaks for it now that we can see how palpably always everything that happens to us turns out for the best indeed, now and then someone plays with us good old chance, now and then chance guides our hand. And the wisest providence could not think up a more beautiful music than that which our foolish hand pro. Dude says then. The thought of death living in the midst of this jumble of little lanes, needs, and voices gives me a melancholy happiness, how much enjoyment, impatience, and desire, how much thirsty life and drunkenness of life comes to light every moment. And yet silence will soon descend on all these noisy, living, life-thirsty people. How his shadow stands even now behind everyone, as his dark fellow traveler. It is always like the last moment before the departure of an emigrant's ship, people have more to say to each other than ever, the hour is late, and the ocean and its desolate silence are waiting impatiently behind all of this noise so covetous and certain of their prey. And all and every one of them suppose that the heretofore was little or nothing while the near future is everything, and that is the reason for all of this haste, this clamor. This outshouting and overreaching each other. Everyone wants to be the first in this future and yet death and deathly silence alone are certain and common to all in this future. How strange it is that this soul certainty and common element makes almost no impression on people, and that nothing is further from their minds than the feeling that they form a brotherhood of death. It makes me happy that men do not want at all to think the thought of death, I should like very much to do something that would make the thought of life even a hundred times more appealing to them. Star friendship we were friends and have become estranged. But this was right, and we do not want to conceal and obscure it from ourselves as if we had reason to feel ashamed. We are two ships each of which has its goal and course, our paths may cross and we may celebrate a feast together. As we did and then the good ships rested so quietly in one harbor and one sunshine that it may have looked as if they had reached their goal and as if they had one goal. But then the almighty force of our tasks drove us apart again into different seas and sunny zones, and perhaps we shall never see each other again, perhaps we shall meet again but fail to recognize each other, our exposure to different seas and suns has changed us. That we have to become estranged wi the law above you, by the same token we should also become more venerable for each other and the memory of our former friendship more sacred. There is probably a tremendous but invisible stellar orbit in which our very different ways and goals may be included as small parts of this path, let us rise up to this thought. But our life is too short and our power of vision too small for us to be more than friends in the sense of this sublime possibility. Let us then believe in our star friendship even if we should be compelled to be earth enemies. Is lacking in our big cities, quiet and wide, expansive places for reflection. The language spoken by these buildings is far too rhetorical and unfree, reminding us that they are houses of God and ostentatious monuments of some supermundane intercourse, we who are godless could not think our thoughts in such surroundings. I welcome all signs that a more virile, warlike age is about to begin. Which will restore honor to courage above all. At long last the search for knowledge will reach out for its due, it will want to rule and possess, and you with it. Few people have faith in themselves. Of these few, some are endowed with it as with a useful blindness or a partial eclipse of their spirit, what would they behold if they could s to the bottom of themselves? While the rest have to acquire it? Everything good, fine, or great they do is first of all an argument against the skeptic inside them. They have to convince or persuade him, and that almost requires genius. These are the great self-dissatisfied people. Perhaps man will rise ever higher as soon as he ceases to flow out into a god. I love my ignorance of the future and do not wish to perish of impatience and of tasting promised things ahead of time. It seems to me that most people simply do not believe in elevated moods. Unless these last for moments only or at most a quarter of an hour nevertheless history might one day give birth to such people. Two once a great many favorable preconditions have been created and determined that even the dice throws of the luckiest chance could not bring together today. Might perhaps be the usual state for these future souls, a perpetual movement between high and low. The feeling of high and low. A continual ascent as on stairs and at the same time a sense of resting on clouds. For one thing is needful, that a human being should attain satisfaction with himself, whether it be by means of this or that poetry and art, only then is a human being at all tolerable to behold. Whoever is dissatisfied with himself is continually ready for revenge. And we others will be his victims. If only by having to endure his ugly sight. For the sight of what is ugly makes one bad and gloomy. 
To those who preach morals I do not wish to promote any morality. But to those who do I give this advice, if you wish to deprive the best things and states of all honor and worth, then go on talking about them as you have been doing. Place them at the head of your morality and talk from morning to night of the happiness of virtue, the composure of the soul, of justice, and imminent retribution. The way you are going about it, all these good things will eventually have popularity and the clamor of the streets on their side, but at the same time all the gold that was on them will have been worn off by so much handling, and all the gold inside will have turned to lead. Truly. You are masters of alchemy in reverse, the devaluation of what is most valuable. Why don't you make the experiment of trying another prescription to keep from attaining the opposite of your goal as you have done hitherto? Deny these good things, withdraw the mob's acclaim from them as well as their easy currency, make them once again concealed secrets of solitary souls, say that morality is something forbidden. That way you might win over for these things the kind of people who alone matter, I mean those who are heroic. But to that end there has to be a quality that inspires fear and not, as hitherto. Nausea. Hasn't the time come to say of morality what Master Eckhart said, I ask God to rid me of God. Against the slanderers of nature I find those people disagreeable in whom every natural inclination immediately becomes a sickness. Something that disfigures them or is downright infamous, it is they that have seduced us to hold that man's inclinations and instincts are evil. They are the cause of our great injustice against our nature, against all nature. There are enough people who might well entrust themselves to their instincts with grace and without care, but they do not, from fear of this imagined evil character of nature. That is why we find so little nobility among men, for it will always be the mark of nobility that one feels no fear of oneself. Expects nothing infamous of oneself, flies without scruple where we feel like flying. We freeborn birds. Wherever we may come there will always be freedom and sunlight around us. I love brief habits and consider them an inestimable means for getting to know many things and states, down to the bottom of their sweetness and bitternesses. I hate enduring habits. I feel as if a tyrant had come near me and as if the air I breathe had thickened when events take such a turn that it appears that they will inevitably give rise to enduring habits most intolerable, would be for me a life entirely devoid of habits. A life that would demand perpetual improvisation. That would be my exile and my Siberia. The ability to contradict, the attainment of a good conscience when one feels hostile to what is accustomed, traditional, and hallowed that is still more excellent and constitutes what is really great, new. And amazing in our culture, this, is the step of steps of the liberated spirit, who knows that? Do you really believe that the sciences would ever have originated and grown if the way had not been prepared by magicians, alchemists, astrologers, and witches whose promises and pretensions first had to create a thirst, a hunger, a taste for hidden and forbidden powers? Perhaps religion could have been the strange means to make it possible for a few single individuals to enjoy the whole self-sufficiency of a god and his whole power of self-redemption. Indeed one might ask would man ever have learned without the benefit of such a religious training and prehistory to experience a hunger and thirst for himself? and to find satisfaction and fullness in himself? For anyone who grows up into the heights of humanity the world becomes ever fuller, ever more fishhooks are cast in his direction to capture his interest, the number of things that stimulate him grows constantly, as does the number of different kinds of pleasure and displeasure, happier and unhappier. But he can never shake off a delusion, he fancies that he is a spectator and listener who has been placed before the great visual and acoustic spectacle that is life, he calls his own nature contemplative and overlooks that he himself is real one why the poet who keeps creating this life but precisely this knowledge we jack. And when we occasionally catch it for a fleeting moment, we always forget it again immediately, we fail to recognize our best power and underestimate ourselves, the contemplatives. Just a little. We are neither as proud nor as happy as we might be. Little riddles are the danger that confronts those who are happiest. Two who are happy truly, in spite of his youth, this is a great improviser of life who amazes even the subtlest observer, for he never seems to make a mistake although he continually takes the greatest risk. If I do not succeed at this, he says to himself, I may perhaps succeed at that, and on the whole I do not know whether I do not have more reason to be grateful to my failures than to any success. Was I made to be stubborn and to have horns like a bull? What constitutes the value and result of life for me lies elsewhere, my pride as well as my misery lie elsewhere. I know more about life because I have so often been on the verge of losing it, and precisely for that reason I get more out of life than any of you. What we do should determine what we forego, by doing we forego that dot is how I like it, that is my place in them. But I do not wish to strive with open eyes for my own impoverishment, I do not like negative virtues virtues whose very essence it is to negate and deny oneself something. Now something that you formerly loved as a truth or probability strikes you as an error, you shed it and fancy that this represents a victory for your reason. But perhaps this error was as necessary for you then, when you were still a different person you are always a different person as are all your present truths. Being a skin, as it were, that concealed and covered a great deal that you were not yet permitted to see. What killed that opinion for you was your new life and not your reason, you no longer need it, 
and now it collapses and unreason crawls out of it into the light like a worm. When we criticize something. This is no arbitrary and impersonal event, it is, at least very often. Evidence of vital energies in us that are growing and shedding a skin. We negate and must negate because something in us wants to live and affirm something that we perhaps do not know or see as yet. This is said in favor of criticism. To be sure, times used to be more beautiful when anyone with a halfway new idea could still feel so indisputable that he would go out into the street and shout at everyone, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Minus one should not miss myself if one were not there. All of us are dispensable. But. To repeat it, that is not how we think when we are bold, then we don't think of this. I have given a name to my pain and call it dog. It is just as faithful, just as obtrusive and shameless. Just as entertaining. Just as clever as any other dog and I can scold it and vent my bad mood on it. As others do with their dogs. Servants, and wives. I want to have my lion and eagle near me so that I always have hints and omens that help me to know how great or small my strength is. Must I look down upon them today and feel fear? And will the hour return when they look up to me in fear? The true pathos of every period of our life rarely becomes clear to us as long as we live in this period, then we always assume that it is the only state that is possible and reasonable for us. There is as much wisdom in pain as there is in pleasure, both belong among the factors that contribute the most to the preservation of the species. If pain did not, it would have perished long ago, that it hurts is no argument against it but its essence. Religious people thirst after things that go against reason. And they do not wish to make it too hard for themselves to satisfy it. So, they experience miracles and rebirths and hear the voices of little angels. But we, we others who thirst after reason, are determined to scrutinize our experiences as severely as a scientific experiment hour after hour, day after day. We ourselves wish to be our experiments and guinea pigs. Let us stop thinking so much about punishing, reproaching, and improving others. We rarely change an individual. And if we should succeed for once, something may also have been accomplished. Unnoticed, we may have been changed by him. Let us rather see to it that our own influence on all that is yet to come balances and outweighs his influence. Let us not contend in a direct fight and that to what all reproaching, punishing, and attempts to improve others amount to. Let us rather raise ourselves that much higher. Let us color our own example ever more brilliantly. Let our brilliance make them look dark. No let us not become darker ourselves on their account. Like all those who punish others and feel dissatisfied. Let us sooner step aside. Let us look away. No, life has not disappointed me. On the contrary, I find it truer, more desirable, and mysterious every year ever since the day when the great liberator came to me, the idea that life could be an experiment of the seeker for knowledge and not a duty. Not a calamity, not trickery. And knowledge itself, let it be something else for others, for example, a bed to rest on, or the way to such a bed, or a diversion. Or a form of leisure for me it is a world of dangers and victories in which heroic feelings. 2. Find places to dance and play. Life as a means to knowledge with this principle in one's heart one can live not only boldly but even gaily. And one og gaily. 2. And who knows how to laugh anyway and live well if he does not first know a good deal about war and victory. To perish of internal distress and uncertainty when one inflicts great suffering and hears the cry of the suffering that is great, that belongs to greatness. Better death than death and formerly. One wished to acquire fame and be spoken of. Now that is no longer enough because the market has grown too large, nothing less than screaming will do. As a consequence, even good voices scream till they are hoarse, and the best goods are offered by cracked voices. Without the screaming of those who want to sell and without hoarseness there no longer is any genius. This is surely an evil age for a thinker. He has to learn how to find his silence between two noises and to pretend to be deaf until he really becomes deaf. Until he has learned this, to be sure, he runs the risk of perishing of impatience and headaches. For the longest time, conscious thought was considered thought itself. Only now does the truth dawn on us that by far the greatest part of our spirit's activity remains unconscious and unfelt. One must learn to love this is what happens to us in music, first one has to learn to hear a figure and melody at all. To detect and distinguish it, to isolate it and delimit it as a separate life. Then it requires some exertion and goodwill to tolerate it in spite of its strangeness, to be patient with its appearance and expression, anu kind-hearted about its oddity. Finally, there comes a moment when we are used to it. When we wait for it, when we sense that we should miss it if it were missing, and now it continues to compel and enchant us relentlessly until we have become its humble and enraptured lovers who desire nothing better from the world than it and only it. But that is what happens to us not only in music. That is how we have learned to love all things that we now love. In the end we are always rewarded for our goodwill, our patience, fair-mindedness, and gentleness with what is strange, gradually, 
it sheds its veil and turns out to be a new and indescribable beauty. That is its thanks for our hospitality. Even those who love themselves will have learned it in this way, for there is no other way. Love. 2. Has to be learned. There are a hundred ways in which you can listen to your conscience. But that you take this or that judgment for the voice of conscience in other words, that you feel something to be right may be due to the fact that you have never thought much about yourself and simply have accepted blindly that what you had been told ever since your childhood was right, or it may be due to the fact that what you call your duty has up to this point brought you sustenance and honors and you consider it right because it appears to you as your own condition of existence, and that you have a right to existence seems irrefutable to you. For all that, the firmness of your moral judgment could be evidence of your personal abjectness, of impersonality, your moral strength might have its source in your stubbornness or in your inability to envisage new ideals. And, briefly, if you had thought more subtly, observed better, and learned more, you certainly would not go on calling this duty of yours and this conscience of your duty and conscience. For it is selfish to experience one's own judgment as a universal law, and this selfishness is blind, petty, and frugal because it betrays that you have not yet discovered yourself nor created for yourself an ideal of your own. Your very own for that could never he somebody else's and much less that of all, all. Anyone who still judges in this case everybody would have to act like this has not yet taken five steps toward self-knowledge. Otherwise, he would know that there neither are nor can be actions that are the same, that every action that has ever been done was done in an altogether unique and irretrievable way, and that this will be equally true of every future action, that all regulations about actions relate only to their coarse exterior, even the most inward and subtle regulations of all moralities so far, that these regulations may lead to some semblance of sameness. That our opinions about good and noble and great can never be proved true by our actions because every action is unknowable, that our opinions, valuations, and tables of what is good certainly belong among the most powerful levers in the involved mechanism of our actions, but that in any particular case the law of their mechanism is indemonstrable. Let us therefore limit ourselves to the purification of our opinions and valuations and to the creation of our own new tables zero slash what is good. And let us stop brooding about the moral value of our actions. Yes, my friends. Regarding all the moral chatter of some about others it is time to feel nauseous. Sitting in moral judgment should offend our taste. Let us leave such chatter and such bad taste to those who have nothing else to do but drag the past a few steps further through time and who never live in the present which is to say the many. The great majority. We. However. Want to become those we owe slash be human beings who are new. Unique. Incomparable, who give themselves laws, who create themselves. To that end we must become the best learners and discoverers of everything that is lawful and necessary in the world, we must become physicists in order to be able to be creators in the sense while hitherto all valuations and ideals have been based on ignorance of physics or were constructed so as to contradict it. Therefore, long live physics. And even more so that which compels us to turn to physics our honesty. If one could endure this immense sum of grief of all kinds while yet being the hero who, as the second day of battle breaks, welcomes the dawn and his fortune, being a person whose horizon encompasses thousands of years past and future, being the heir of all the nobility of all past spirit and heir with a sense of obligation the most aristocratic of old nobles and at the same time the first of a new nobility the like of which no age has yet seen or dreamed of, if one could burden one soul with all of this the oldest, the newest, losses, hopes, conquests, and the victories of humanity, if one could finally contain all this in one soul and crowd it into a single feeling this while one d surely have to result in a happiness that humanity has not known so far, the happiness of a God full of power and love, full of tears and laughter. A happiness that, like the sun in the evening, continually bestows its inexhaustible riches. Pouring them into the sea, feeling richest. As the sun does. Only when even the poorest fisherman is still rowing with golden oars. This godlike feeling would then be called humaneness. How little you know of human happiness. You comfortable and benevolent people, for happiness and unhappiness are sisters and even twins that either grow up together or, as in your case, remain small together. I do not want to remain silent about my morality which says to me, live in seclusion so that you can jive for yourself. Live in ignorance about what seems most important to your age. Between yourself and today lay the skin of at least three centuries. And the clamor of today. The noise of wars and revolutions should be a mere murmur for you. You will also wish to help but only those whose distress you understand entirely because they share with you one suffering and one hope your friends and only in the manner in which you help yourself. I want to make them bolder, more persevering. Simpler. Gear. I want to teach them what is understood by so few today. Least of all by these preachers of pity, to share not suffering but joy. I mean to say that the world is overfull of beautiful things but nevertheless poor. Very poor when it comes to beautiful moments and unveilings of these things but perhaps this is the most powerful magic of life, it is covered by a veil interwoven with gold, a veil of beautiful possibilities, sparkling with promise, resistance, bashfulness, mockery, pity. 
and seduction. Yes, life is a woman. What, if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more, and there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence even this spider and this moonlight between the trees, and even this moment and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are or perhaps crush you. The question in each and everything, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more? Would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal?